Hi everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the Disabled Lawyer and Plan. Today we have Emma Bergman, who works as lead policy advisor for children and young people at SEP. She previously works for most of the disability UK for three years, where she ran on the disability employment work which included writing the Ready and Able Report, which was launched at Parliament in 2019. Emma also worked freelance in policy, public speaking, communications, writing, accessibility consultation, and social media. She has also worked with SMA UK, doing online community sessions. I'm a graduate of Queen Mary University. I'm going to not keep seeing up for me in 2016. While I was at Queen Mary, she interned at the British Institute of Human Rights and was the assistant editor of the Queen Mary Human rights will be being. After I take a moment to catch my breath, <laughs> we will we will jump in. Emma, it's great to have you on this able warrior and prayer. I've known you for such a long time. And it's great to see you again. The first question that comes to mind, given the way you do. Is what does being disabled mean to you? So I now feel uh, a bit mean because I ask this question on the podcast that I host. And I always think that it's going to be such an easy question to answer, but it absolutely isn't. Um, well, now you know what it feels like to be on the other side of the question. I know I I feel like I need to email and apologize all of my pre- to all of my previous guests. Um but I think it's a really difficult question to answer. I think if you would ask me what disability means to me before um I think it was around uh, 2016 like early 2016 I would have said it didn't really mean that much. Um, it wasn't really part of my life, even though I've always been an electric wheelchair user. And since 20, oh, 2009, sorry, um, is when I started using a ventilator through a tracheostomy after I got the swine flu when I was living in the States. But it disability really didn't play much of a role in my life. There was nothing that I was really prevented from doing that I wanted to do up until 2016 um, when at the university that we both went to um, had some really old lifts and it kept breaking down and it was sort of the first time that I was prevented from accessing what my non-disabled peers were able to access just because I was disabled. Um, And so it was at that point that the social model of disability really came to life for me. I always thought it was kind of a silly idea because I thought, yeah, well, it may be a ramp, which means I can get in, but I'm still using a wheelchair to get into the building. But when you're prevented from accessing things at all, just because you're disabled, that really it really clicked for me that society is what causes disability. And when access and adaptations are there to provide equal opportunity and equal access, that's when disability comes to life. Um, so I would say now, it for me, it means... What does it mean? It essentially, to me means that there are things that society prevents me from doing, whether that's in terms of people's attitudes, in terms of physical access, digital access, um, 
but if things are adapted and changed, then my disability no longer becomes a thing. That's the great thing about extension model of disability. I think it highlights a, a real problem is all the values in society rather than putting the emphasis on the individual being a problem. Because I think it makes an important point about redesigning the way the world works and the buildings and all that kind of thing without taking into account disabled people. So I think it's it's a model I like that problem. Yeah, it's... Sorry, carry on. Now we're speaking about what disability means. Are you proud to be disabled? So... Yes, I think is the short answer. I think I'm definitely proud to be part of such an amazing community that is the disabled community. I think like I've met some of the kindest, most determined people in the disabled community that I've ever met. Um, I think the only hesitation I have around completely saying yes, I'm proud to be disabled, is that sometimes being disabled is really hard. And I think a lot of the time we can get into this narrative of toxic positivity, you know, where we just talk about how wonderful our lives are and that they're not a tragedy in the way that sometimes media can portray disability, which I completely agree is inaccurate for so much of the time. But I think not addressing that sometimes being disabled can be really hard. It can get you emotionally down sometimes. It can challenge your resilience. I think all of that's really important to mention. Um, So on those days, I think, I wouldn't say I'm not proud to be disabled, but I realize that being disabled comes with a lot of difficulties, as well as a lot of amazing benefits, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it makes perfect sense, right, because while we're all doing what we can to lead independent life, it's still about that we have impairment that not only makes life complicated, well, on top of that, we are also navigating and dealing with all the obstacles in society as well. And all that difficulty comes at an energy cost. Yeah. Uh, and the emotional well being cost as well. And uh, it makes absolute sense. Yeah, I think it's it's something that I don't feel is talked about enough. I think we're getting a little bit better as a disabled community around talking about that. You know, I think that there are some people who acknowledge, you know, the burnout that comes around with disability activism and content creation or whatever it may be that's around disability and realizing that it does take a toll. Um, but I think that's something that I wish I knew about when I was a young disabled person that, you know, it's okay that there are difficult days. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're a bad disabled person and you can still be proud of all of the wonderful things that come with your disability. So we've spoken a bit about disability and being disabled and what that means and how pride comes into it. What are the key aims of this campaign? It's to increase the visibility of disabled lawyers and a variety of ways people can work with law or in law. With that being said, 
Would you mind telling us what your impairment is? Yeah, of course. So I have a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It comes under the umbrella of muscular dystrophy. Um, and it's essentially, it's a muscle wasting condition. So it's progressive. Um, so it will, you know, has and will continue to get worse as I get older. So it means that I'm a full-time electric wheelchair user. Um, and as I mentioned already, this isn't totally related to my um, spinal muscular atrophy. But when I was 15 living in the States, I got the swine flu fun times um, and ended up getting a tracheostomy, which I use a ventilator through. So that is my very complex medical history in a tiny, tiny nutshell. Thank you for saying that with us. I think it's important that people talk about the impairments they have because we want to encourage people with similar impairments to pursue whatever careers they wish to pursue, including in law. Mm. Having talked about your impairment a little bit, you currently work as a lead policy advisor for children and young people as help help to get charity that I'm familiar with because obviously I have a terrible problem and help is a charity focusing mainly on people with terrible problems. What what does what does your job involve? So as lead policy advisor, essentially what I do is I look at what are the issues facing disabled children, disabled young people, and their families. Um, and what I've been working on since I've been in that role is looking at the inclusion of families with disabled children in sort of everyday places. So a big focus for us has been on playgrounds. Um, which may seem like really niche, but it was something that came through when we were speaking with parents and carers of disabled children, sort of asking where, what are the places that you go or would like to go that you currently have any either physical barriers or attitudinal barriers um, or anything like that. And it really came through strongly that playgrounds was a space that they weren't able to access and enjoy like other families. So my job was to look at that situation and look at what could the potential solutions be to disabled families being included and come up with ideas um, around that. Um, am I allowed to shamelessly self-promo the work that we're doing? You can promote yourself as much as you are. Amazing, thank you. Um, so as part of that uh, project, we've just launched a, can okay, I say just launched, it was about a month ago, a campaign called Let's Play Fair, um, which if you're interested in go on to Scope's website, and we have an open letter um, at the minute, which will go to the English government and the Welsh government, asking them to create funding for local authorities to be able to renovate Playgrounds or design new ones that are inclusive of disabled children. So please go go sign that. Um, and it's just it's been a wonderful project to work on in this role. I do think it's such an important project because such a lot of emphasis is placed on play in the areas. Mm. Children develop so much to play, and if play isn't equally accessible, disabled children are obviously at a disadvantage, not only in making friends, but also the development that comes through play. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think it's it was a real shock for me because I grew up in the States um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, you know, there wasn't anything that I was prevented from doing. I'm aware that America is a much newer country than the UK and, you know, funding structures are totally different, but I wasn't prevented from playing at a playground like my non-disabled friends. So working on this project was quite sad, I suppose, in a way at the start because it was so upsetting to me that disabled children in the UK weren't getting those core childhood experiences that so many people I think could take for granted. And I certainly realized that I probably took that for granted as, you know, just something that every kid does. So of course, why wouldn't I do it? Um, so it's, yeah, it was, it's been a really important campaign and it's just been a pleasure to see people engage with it and you know parents get in touch saying like oh you know this is a place that we really want to go as a family but my disabled child has to sit and listen to an audio but well their non-disabled sibling plays and that's just unacceptable to me that a child is made to feel that way it kind of takes me back to when I was young because we would go away on a family holiday to the beach. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly keen on the beach anyway. Well, obviously, I can't get on the beach. I haven't found a beach in the UK that I could get on. If I was a boat to I could go up. But I could be far away. Um, and uh, uh, well, my grandparents' way of mitigating that was, you know, I would play on my Game Boy while on my brother and sister played on the beach. <laughs> now I was quite happy playing Pokemon on my Game Boy, but it, it wasn't quite the same experience. Uh, I, I, I do, um, I do identify with the issue. You've obviously done great work in, in your job now and in your previous roles. What is the best experience of your career been? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think the the campaign around playgrounds and the conversations I've been able to have with parents and carers has certainly been amazing um seeing them really feel listened to um and have an issue that could be so seemingly small being taken up by a large you know national charity and sort of the feeling of being seen um by them has been really amazing but I think the other thing that I'm really proud of um in my career has been the work that I did during the pandemic. Um, it was also with Scope, um, but I was a policy advisor on the consumer affairs team. And during that time, we were looking at disabled people's access to food. And um, so we looked at the online experience of disabled people and the in-store experience during the pandemic and do various lockdowns. And people were really struggling with accessing essential food and whether that was because the website was inaccessible or they weren't able to get a delivery slot or they were in store and were told that they couldn't pick something up to look at it even though they had a visual impairment which meant that they needed to to be able to tell what it was um and all of those really difficult experiences turned into a report that Scope published um, on the issue where we made recommendations to supermarkets on improvements that they could make for their disabled customers. Um, and then we held an online conference talking about those recommendations and hearing from supermarkets um, and hearing from disabled customers about their experiences and sort of creating a bit of a dialogue, that was a really special moment because it felt like we were getting some real movement on the issues by bringing together all of the relevant 
parties bringing in scopes expertise on accessibility and inclusion and turning that into real change was just amazing. It's important to be able to go shopping. I'll get to go shopping and be. It's not always the most accessible experience online or in person. Speaking of obstacles, what are the biggest obstacles that you've experienced in your in your career? Um. So. For me, it actually wasn't during my career per se, but it was while I was trying to figure out what my career was going to be. Um, I, when I was at university, I went into studying law thinking that I wanted to be a barrister um, and I was really passionate about human rights or that I wanted to do something in that area and I did a mini work experience um for the um with a barrister chambers and I was told by the barrister I was doing the work experience with that I probably wouldn't be successful um because to be successful as a barrister they said you have to be the first one in in the morning and the last one out in the evening to really show your dedication and I just knew that my disability wouldn't allow me to do that you know from a stamina perspective health perspective um so I was essentially told that I wasn't going to be able to be a barrister um and I I did listened to that more than I should have and I really deviated my career path um, from that moment because I took that to be true I didn't know any other disabled lawyers or barristers at the time you could tell me otherwise and I know that that was just one person's opinion but it changed my entire path um, and I think that was a really difficult challenge for me to overcome so figuring out what I wanted to do instead that still met what I was passionate about and was something that my disability would allow me to do um it's honestly one of my biggest regrets listening to that advice and taking it to heart so much I wish I'd done my homework a bit more um and realized that that was just one person to pick up it is one person's opinion, but it's a fact that you are not the only one to be giving such advice on, on the way to a bar. Um, I know several people who were disabled who were giving similar advice, myself included. Um, I didn't crave it away from poverty. But, um, we many of us get given at feedback. One of the biggest barriers at the bar, according to research, is people's attitudes towards working practices. If you were ever to reconsider joining the bar, I'm sure you wouldn't be the only person who has um, Long traditional work pattern. I know parents who have given work patterns, disabled people, people with given um, social situations. And yeah. I think we need to work on changing people's perceptions of what you need to do to be about um, Obviously, you need to be a fundamental part of the job. But that mentality, it probably not essential, and people can put real well without that mindset. It is a shame because that means 
you are a living example of the kind of telling boys missing out because of the issues within it. And, and, and that goes actually maybe well we get the point get the point. Um, yeah. I think it is really disappointing. I mean not just for me with my you know career path being changed from what I initially wanted, but I think you know when you said about people missing out, I mean I it just made me think that there's such empathy that sometimes is needed in law. I mean, I know sometimes it does have to be quite clinical and, you know, facts-based, but when you're working with people, I think, and trying to get people to believe that you are the, the right person to be helping them with sometimes an extremely serious or a really dire situation, I think having empathy would be a huge asset. And that's something that I know I have. I think a lot of disabled people do because we do face challenges every day and we're able to, you know, think more widely than sort of just ourselves, um, if that makes sense. So I think, you know, the pandemic has been a little bit of a silver lining when you said about different working patterns. We've it's shown that people can work from home. If that's what works for them, it shows that people have lots of responsibilities, whether, like you said, that be children or caring or disability needs. You know, there are so many different types of people that benefit from reasonable adjustments more than just disabled people. Absolutely. I mean, it's been a good thing with me, and it is difficult. Because it is unfair. What what advice would you give to somebody considering a similar career, whether that be pursuing a bar or working in policy for a large security like you? So, my first bit of advice is to do your homework. Um, which I didn't do. And by that, I mean, reach out to more people in the profession to see if you can find yourself represented there and ask how those people's experience was. So, you know, say, I mean, I don't think we've touched on this, but I think you were in just a year above me at uni. So, if, but if I were in uni now and I knew you, you know, doing the work that you're doing you'd be one of the people that I reach out to to ask you know how did you find this experience and not just take a non-disabled person's word for it in terms of what they think you can do or can't do because the person who told me that knew me for maybe three days um so I really didn't know what I was capable of and I regret listening to it so I would give people the advice to reach out to other people in the profession and ask them about their experience but in terms of advice for people interested in policy I think you know with your audience I'm assuming a lot of people are interested in law so what I would say is if you do think that the bar or the solicitor route isn't what you want to do then policy work and charity really does make use of legal knowledge and the skills that you develop during your law degree, sort of your ability to do critical thinking, analysis, um, you know, all of those things are, are really important and really beneficial. And I think it's a real privilege to be able to do a job where you make policy recommendations either government or major businesses to improve the lives of disabled people um so it's it's a different way of affecting change than law but it's it's a wonderful career to be in and it's something I really enjoy doing and yeah I would again encourage people to reach out to 
people working in that area. See if you can find people who may share the same lived experiences as you and ask them how they found it. Because people are always willing to share from their experience, I found. That's interesting because policy work is fascinating. I'm going a bit with people with disability rights you can I was supposed a policy thinking and I wrote some evidence for the Equality Act Committee at, at one point. It's interesting how you separate law and policy because, in my mind, in many ways, law and policy intertwine with one another. So, in my mind, it's not exclusive. You can, you, if you are interested in law, policy may also interest you. Yeah, what? and I think not just policy but charity work overall I think you did this as well but like you mentioned at the start I interned at the British Institute of Human Rights while I was at uni um, because it is it was an it is an organization that tries to translate law like legal precedents cases and all of that and make it into something that people can understand and that people have accurate information on. So, you know, if policy may not be your thing, then maybe something like that would be of interest. There's a lot to do in the charity sector that is really beneficial to have a lot of background for. Absolutely. The charity sector is remarkable. Um, I spent a lot of time in it. I'm still in it in many ways. And it is a fascinating sector and serious policy. We've obviously both got an interest in policy and law. What do you think the most pertinent issues are in disability rights at the moment? Oh, what a big question. Um... You can put whatever bag we you feel so I think one of the biggest issues at the moment is the cost of living crisis. So we already know that before this crisis, disabled people have to pay so much more every month to achieve the same standard of living as their non-disabled peers. So this crisis has really just made that so much worse and it's putting a lot of disabled people and their families into incredibly tough financial situations we're seeing that at the minute in terms of energy and um, because disabled people will often need to obviously not in the summer but they'll need to use more energy to heat their home for example if they need the house to be slightly warmer or it would cause medical problems for them if they were to get too cold or they need to charge bits of medical equipment so all of these sort of non-optional things that come with their disability come with an increased cost and right now with prices on everything honestly soaring so much I think it's it's a huge issue and a huge concern of the disabled community right now and I think that there are some positive steps that are being taken to address that in terms of things like the one-off payments that um, the government have announced, but I think there's still a long way to go because even before the cost of living crisis, disabled people are having extra costs. I, you know, this is just an example from my personal life for today, but I'm planning a trip to the States later this year and my dad, who is non-disabled, his travel insurance in terms of you know medical health insurance was about sixty pounds for me with for coverage for my disability is over a thousand pounds. So I think that sort of speaks for itself, but I think it's you know it's it's a huge issue for disabled people the the cost of living and the crisis right now. Visibility of the price 
another big question. I think, I think the, I think one of the easiest solutions to the problems that disabled people face is awareness of those issues. I think that so many people are unaware of things like the extra costs that we face or the physical barriers that wheelchair users like ourselves will face. And sometimes I feel like I can't blame them if they're not aware of it and they don't encounter it as a barrier, then why would they be aware of it? So I think once they are aware that things are discriminatory against disabled people, then I think we're able to see change in action on those issues. Like I think when people open a business, for example, and it's only after a disabled person's tried to go into their, you know, their shop, store, floor, whatever it may be, and they realize that someone can't enter it, then they make little adaptations to make sure that it's accessible. So I think it's the awareness of those barriers that's crucial for people to make those simple changes or sometimes much larger changes to improve our everyday lives. So I would say that the solution at the minute is around raising awareness. Um, I couldn't agree more on the fact that we important for awareness. I mean, it seems fantastic to be able to speak to you again. I'm sorry your news will find it fascinating and helpful to hear from you and your advice. Thank you again for joining the Disabled Warrior and Proud Company. For the people who don't know who I am, I am the chair of the Association of Disabled Life. And it's been a pleasure to talk to you, Emma. No, me too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, everybody else, I'll see you for the next episode. Thank you.
ठीक है भाई थैंक यू मैम